Welcome back to the show, everybody. Well, check this out. Automated market maker vote slips. We're going to talk about it. What's going to happen here? Then we also have to talk about this, the SEC still trying to make XRP the XRP ledger and now automated market makers, securities. Uh, we got that and so much more. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube for exclusive content. Right now, it is $1.73 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is up 0.7%. Right now, Bitcoin, 42900 2300 plus for Ethereum, $96.2 billion plus for market cap for Tether. XRP at the number seven spot, ladies and gentlemen, as USDC took the number six spot today. 50 cents for XRP, up 0.3 on the 24-hour, off by 0.8 on the 7-day. The range of price very quickly here between 49 51 cents. We'll keep an eye on it as the day goes here. Uh, link to, ladies and gentlemen, private access to private investment. Make sure you click the link to my sponsor below and get the private equity you want in your portfolio before it's gone. There's just one bad habit that Link2 has is when they bring all this great stuff on the platform, it gets bought up very quickly so if you want some click the link to the sponsor sign up and register and get started today all right here we go ashley prosper wants us all to take a little walk down the memory lane and it's a great idea thank you ashley take a listen to this from years ago brad garlinghouse sitting at a little conference at mit club in northern california and i want you to listen to what he says here it's very pertinent to what we're going to lay out today uh, there are investors who are interested in, uh, frankly, speculating on uh, where XRP is going to go. And, you know, to the extent we are successful solving a multi-trillion dollar problem using XRP and integrating XRP into those flows, it's going to drive a lot of demand for XRP. Again, I said earlier, you know, the, the, the market cap of XRP today is around $25 billion. You're solving a $27 trillion problem. You know, I'm not saying it's going to $27 trillion, mind you. I, you take a lot of friction out of that system. But, uh, you know, when I think about the other use cases and consumer use cases, I think there are a lot of other use cases where we think XRP could be a very efficient digital asset. Ripple is focused on payments. And we think about it kind of the same way. You know, Amazon was really good at books. The name of the company actually was Amazon Books. It wasn't Amazon. And then they decided, hey, let's go do another vertical. When I think about what Ripple's trying to do, we want to be extremely good at solving a very large problem around payments and liquidity for on a global basis. We are actively, frankly, investing in other use cases for XRP, and those aren't things we will pursue, but some of them will be consumer-centric, some of them will be in marketplaces. Uh, but those are things that you know, we will uh, you know, partner with or help entrepreneurs go and, and build uh, solutions that take advantage of, you know, with a very performant asset relative to uh, most of the other digital assets I, out I think there. When we talk about Jamie Dimon, we first have to recognize where he sits. That's right. uh, he sits at the top of the global financial infrastructure. There are a few banks, of which JPM is certainly one, that make billions and billions of dollars of profit by virtue of that perch. You know, 99.9% .9 of banks don't make money in this ecosystem in terms of cross-border payments. Jamie Dimon makes a technical term of a shit ton of money by sitting there. <laughs> so when I hear Jamie Dimon saying he's a fraud, I think to myself, well, of course he's going to say that. He's talking, I mean, and by the way, there's also, you know, people who uh, conspiratorially, uh, he's trying to talk down the price of Bitcoin so he can, JPM can buy it. Like the, the idea that the idea that JP Morgan isn't actively working in the blockchain and Bitcoin space is not true. Uh, I mean, I, frankly, I don't mind sharing. There are about 15 senior JP Morgan people at Ripple's offices this afternoon. Now, unless JP Morgan is going to fire them. <laughs> I, Does JP Diamond know that? I, apparently not. Anyway, so look, that's my thought on the whole JP Diamond thing. I do think there are people who are going to say this is, you know, uh, in the same manner, a very smart investor said to me, uh, you know, in 1997, the whole West Coast was long Amazon and the whole East Coast was shorting Amazon. We saw how that worked out. And his point was basically, look, you know, the West Coast is obviously bullish and, you know, there's some that are very cynical about these things and, you know, we'll see how it works out. On the, the risk factor, just very briefly, because I don't want to go on too long, but 
I think what we have to remind ourselves is this has to come back to utility. What problem is the digital asset solving? If it's solving a real problem and it's creating value by solving that problem, then there will be value in the token. And there you could see a list of all the banks and uh, the you know relationships that Ripple has had over the years, and it's pretty phenomenal. But I wanted to set the tone to that today because we know that the world is changing very fast. For instance, listen to what Swift is doing. You know, for those of us who you know, there's a look. There's a lot of uh, negative sentiment, right? And I'm not showing this to change anybody's mind. I'm showing this because it's important to understand exactly where the major players in the world that can benefit from this technology, where are they? Where are they? Not where do we guess they are, where are they? Well, this gentleman from Swift's gonna tell you exactly where they are. They have already launched a coexistence period of ISO 20022, which means the old payment rails are running alongside of the new payment rails and have been and will continue to do so for a short period of time, probably 2025, and there will be a complete, a complete transformation and move over to the new payment rails. Take a listen. So thank you for your insights. What's next for Swift? So at Swift, we're on, a, we're on a truly exciting journey. Our, our mission is really to deliver instant and frictionless uh, transactions. Uh, and so we've made tremendous progress this year with the, uh, the launch of the coexistence period for ISO 20022, the beginning of the rollout of our transaction management platform, and also really uh, driving forward our innovation uh, agenda. I, I've mentioned digital currencies and digital assets, Equally, we're uh, very excited about the progress we're making with artificial intelligence and the ability to apply artificial intelligence to the uh, transactional data uh, that SWIFT has to enable us to better detect anomalies and therefore uh, inform our, our clients um, and, and improve uh, you know, the, the quality of, uh, uh, of, of their data and the ability to ensure that fewer payments get stopped and more of them make it through to their destination uh, at speed. 2024, that's your sales pitch. We're still trying to plug the leaks of where your payment went. <laughs> Believe me, listen, as a former global importer, I know exactly what Swift is like. It's a nightmare. Then there's this. There's been so much FUD and negativity in this space. I think, uh, is it, I, I want to say his name, Arkadiza? Arcadius? Arcadius. I think it's Arcadius. Anyway, shout out to Arcadius. He says, keep believing the FUD while Ripple was setting up rails around the world. This just in Payments Canada today said, this is February 5th, Ripple to expand in the U.S. staff, free 7-Elevens in Tokyo and new UPI partnership for Lira, MPCI, which we covered the UPI partnership. You know, this is exciting because everything is still moving towards the goal. If you look at the fundamental news, what's still happening, right? We know the OCC in the United States has put the boot on the back of the financial institutions and banks and said, do not even think of touching this digital asset business at all until we say so. That's where we are. But you know what? Janet Yellen was set to address the House Financial Services Committee, where she will emphasize the risk associated with cryptocurrency platforms and stable coins. And she did exactly that. I want to play that for you now. Remember, as I set the table for this, Janet Yellen is obviously the head of the U.S. Treasury, which also makes her by default the head of FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is a collective prudential regulator combined of prudential regulators and market regulators. So it's the SEC, it's the CFTC, which are market regulators, combined with prudential regulators like FinCEN, right? And so on and so on and so on, the Treasury. And you get it. So take a listen. For five minutes. And so let's begin with your last point um, on the regulation of the spot market for digital assets. Um, this committee has produced two bipartisan bills, one on stable coins, one on market structure, to regulate the spot market of uh, digital assets and provide this clarity between the CFTC and the SEC. Um, so you, test, you testify that FSOC's view is that we need uh, federal law 
and law changes on the spot market. Can you tell us why? Can you describe why that's FSOC's belief? Um, well, there are many um, areas with respect to digital assets where we do have clear regulatory authority, but we've identified some gaps where um, for consumer investor protection and to address financial stability risk, it would be very useful for Congress to take action to fill those gaps. And um, the CFTC, for example, um, doesn't have uh, supervisory or regulatory authority with respect to spot markets and commodities like Bitcoin. So that's a regulatory gap. Furthermore, stable coins pose risk to the financial system that um, both FSOC and the President's Working Group on Financial Markets have identified as potentially becoming significant over time. And we would very much welcome an effort um, by Congress to um, create a regulatory framework that, was, that would be appropriate to address those risks. So similar to, so stable coins are now being regulated by the states. New York has a very uh, resilient regime. Are you suggesting something like that the New York regime would be applicable to, to fix this problem? Um, well, FSOC believes that um, it's critical for there to be a federal regulatory floor that would apply to all states and that a federal regulator should have the ability to um, decide if a stable coin um, issuer should, should be barred from uh, presenting, from issuing such an asset. Okay. Um, also, we believe that because wallets um, are a critical part of the stable coin uh, ecosystem, and we've seen many instances in which there have been significant losses that it's critical to um, enact regulatory uh, protections uh, for holders of wallets. So back to the spot market, though. Uh, as you, as in your report, you, you state clearly that we need to change law for us to have, have proper regulation of the digital asset uh, spot market. That's. Is that yes, correct? That, that's a recommendation. Okay. Five. So there you have that, right? So there's the recommendation. And remember what we've talked about, right? And by the way, I have an exclusive interview with Perry Ann Boring from the uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce that's coming out later today. You're going to want to watch every part of that. There's every second of that. There's no kidding. There's a lot of information in there, and you're going to want it. So watch out for that to drop. But remember, FSOC created by the Dodd-Frank Act. Who was one of the main architects of the Dodd-Frank Act? Michael S. Barr, former Treasury official, former Ripple advisor, now the vice president of the Federal Board of Governors. With me? This stablecoin business isn't over. This is another short clip, but we don't need to play it. It's overlap. But nevertheless, shout out to Ty Taylor Barr. And shout out to Eleanor uh, Tre uh, Tarrant, who's talking about, uh, obviously, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet, pushes Congress to pass crypto legislation in a House hearing on financial stability. This is what the role of FSOC is. It's the domestic side of the prudential regulation. OFAC is the foreign side, right? So you have FSOC and OFAC, right? There's your domestic side, foreign side. These are all going to play major roles in where we're going. But... Where are we going? The automated market maker amendment has dropped below the required 80% threshold. Three validators have changed their vote back to no. I believe this is due to a bug that was found, and it does believe I do believe the same because I found the information. And a fix is in progress and will be released once available. Don't get disheartened by this news. Better to fix it now than to have issues later. This is exactly right. And shout out to Ashley Prosper for that uh, update because it's exactly what's happened. It has dipped below the 80%, but a bug was found. And this is exactly why it's supposed to run 80% consensus for two weeks. Because if you do find something wrong, you want to fix it before you make it an actual permanent part of the ledger, right? 
for sure, no doubt about it. This here from Emmy Yoshikawa was shared. Shout out to Emmy. But instead, supporting it with a protocol is a big deal. Everyone spend time scrutinizing features like AMMs, right? And verifying that there are no bugs or unintended behavior. And in the end, the product is accepted by the community and put into practical use. Therefore, they cannot be compared to automated market maker projects. If she's the referencing here, other projects that are AMMs are not the same as the AMM for the ledger because they're created by third parties using general purpose smartphone computers and they are not competing for speed of market introduction. We are aiming for a feature that will be used by many people for a long time. So of course it will take time in a sense the failures and successes of projects are in the area are also helpful in considering the optimal design. This is exactly right. We are creating something that will last forever equals built to last. It may be more fun for a developer to be able to create things quickly during the experimental phase, but I strongly believe that this type of long-term approach is essential during the mass adoption phase. And boy, do we like hearing the mass adoption phase. And it's exactly right. Shout out to Emmy Yoshikawa for sharing that um, in her post on the XRP Ledger and Automated Market Makers. And this here, one of my dream scenarios, I wanted to ask... Grok, the AI, you guys know I've had this dream scenario that automated market makers could change the design and the characteristics of XRP in the way that it may be looked at from a regulator or banker's point of view as a stable coin. Now, I want to take a look here at what we have here. I asked simply of Grok, the AI tool here on the platform, can XRP become a stable coin with automated market makers, AMMs, acting as a stabilization mechanism. Now, Grok is AI. It doesn't mean that this is just the way it is. It's just Grok's answer to the question as best that Grok can answer it. And it says, yes, it is possible for XRP to become a stable coin with the help of automated market makers acting as a stabilization mechanism. The key idea behind this is to use AMMs to manage the supply and demand for XRP in order to maintain a stable value. Here's a simplified exp explanation of how it could work. An AMM is set up to manage the supply and demand of XRP. This could be done using liquidity pools that contain both XRP and stable coins such as USDC. When the price of XRP rises above the target, the AMM will automatically sell uh, XRP for USDC, increasing the supply of XRP and decreasing the price. When the price of XRP falls below the target, the AMM will buy XRP with USDC, decreasing the supply of XRP. And then it goes on to say here, if I could get this where it jumps up, the, this process will continue until the price of XRP stabilizes around the target value. And then it goes on to say the use of AMMs as a stable coin stabilization mechanism for XRP could help to reduce price volatility and increase confidence in the cryptocurrency. However, it is important to note that there are potential risks and challenges associated with this approach. Further research and development is needed to determine the feasibility and effectiveness. No question about that. But, you know, I believe that Ripple has done the work, and that's the reason that we're at the moment we're in now. We just need to make sure that before it's introduced to the ledger, that all the bugs are worked out. And it seems to me that's exactly where we are. I am super excited about all of this that's happening, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, the SEC very quickly here has put out new rules on how it could affect the upcoming XRP ledger and automated market makers. Well, the SEC just doesn't take a day off and we better not either. They just recently adopted a set of rules that would mandate liquidity providers to duly register with the agency when dealing with assets considered to be securities or government securities, including cryptocurrencies. The rule, which passed a three to two vote from the SEC, also applied to centralized finance sector. It will with implications for liquidity providers on AMMs. If you get into this, it bears mentioning the SEC first proposed this set of regulations in March of 22, clearly disclosing an intent to rope the DeFi sector into it. The draft received criticism from crypto industry leaders who contended that the de decentralized nature of DeFi protocols makes it infeasible. 
the recent development suggests an implementation of rules despite the initial uproar. Based on new rules, a certain category of liquidity providers on any AMM instance would need to register with the SEC if the assets they are dealing with are considered securities. Well, we know XRP in and of itself is not a security. This could pose an extra challenge as even centralized exchanges have had a hard time registering the SEC due to lack of clarity. For this reason, Coinbase, which the SEC sued late last year, um, has dragged the securities regulator into court demanding clear rulemaking policy. Now, what's interesting about all of this is uh, Hester Peirce, who voted against the implementation of new rule set, questioned who would be required to register with the agency, the individual who writes the software code of the AMM or the individuals who deposit their assets to serve as liquidity providers, right? Then it goes on to say here, uh, the SEC staff in a rather ambiguous statement suggests that the individuals who use the software to deal with cryptocurrencies uh, would need to register. Purse argued that the regulator, uh, regulatory uncertainty surrounding the crypto industry would make it difficult for actual compliance. And does it affect the LPs, liquidity providers on the XRP ledger AMM? Crypto Arsenal puts it down here exactly the way it goes. XRP trades for eight years. SEC says it's a security. XRP Ledger gets NFTs. SAC says they are securities. XRP Ledger gets AMMs. SEC says AML liquidity providers have to register. Meanwhile, Ethereum over there with its initial coin offering, disguised whales, links to China, hack scandals, rug pulls, the list goes on and on. Coming down here, there is Bill Morgan implied that the regulations could negatively impact some entities responsible for liquidity provisions in the crypto scene. He wonders which entities in the crypto market will be most harmed by this penalizing of liquidity provision. Why is the SEC and the vested interest it serves so concerned about liquidity provisions? I think there it is. There's the answer he's giving us right there. Is that they're concerned about it because the banks have told them to squash it. Because there's only one entity that is threatened by liquidity provisions and liquidity pools being provided outside of the bank's providing them. <laughs> this is not difficult, right? This is not difficult right here. So the, the, here, here's where we need to go here, right? Because it does say, however, the rule might not affect or impact retail liquidity providers on the XRPL AMM in the DeFi scene. According to SEC's documentation, the new regulations do not apply to liquidity providers with less than $50 million worth of assets. In addition, the XRP's current status as a non-security, as decided by the judge Annalisa Torres last July, the XRP community has pointed out the individuals providing liquidity for XRP might not have to worry about the new rule set. So we will see where all of this goes. But we also have to wonder, too, if this would force all exchanges, decentralized and otherwise, to apply for an alternative trading license. And would that affect the XRP ledger as well? So many questions still yet left to answer, ladies and gentlemen, but this is where we are on this day. And I leave you very quickly with this. Chris Larson believes we will face a catastrophe in the U.S. cannot provide clear regulatory rules for cryptocurrency. It is absolutely, I believe, the truth. And we are reaching a moment where there's going to be real damage done if the United States government doesn't get off of their ass and do their job. OK, how do we compete with China? How do we keep up? And, you know, till now, frankly, U.S. regulators have actually helped China by officially uh -huh. giving clarity to the two protocols effectively controlled by Chinese miners, Bitcoin and Ethereum. There you go. That's what we've seen happen. Chris knows exactly what the score is. Right? Oh, yeah. That's a mistake. Um, that is a mistake. We've got to also give uh, clarity at least and maybe even support, if this really becomes a tech cold, cold war like it's looking like it will be, uh, to technologies that are more favorable to U.S. and its allies' stewardship of the next-gen global financial system. Otherwise, we face a potential catastrophe. You know, I don't know what the odds are, but there's some meaningful, uh, you know, probability if China was to get control over the next gen financial system. I mean, that, that could really be devastating to American uh, power and its allies ability to, to uh, you know, uh, make payments to uh, defense payments to uh, an ally, uh, American banks that might be blocked or throttled back on, on uh, how, how fast their payments go. 
you know, you could even see some terrible situation where a U.S. company that has a low Chinese social credit score could be blocked from that new infrastructure. You know, those are bad outcomes. Even if there's a small percentage chance that happens, we've, we've, we've got to check that to make sure that we're involved and we're, we're competitive as a country. There's no question about it. What he's saying is absolutely spot on. Now we're getting ready to head into the Freedom Zone and I hope you will join us. What a great way to support the channel at digperspectives.com. Come on in, not financial advice from me or anyone else. And today we're going to get into what does it look like and what would it take in order to get a $25 XRP? We're going to take a real good look at that today, right now in the Freedom Zone. Come on in. 